tonight's topic is one that is really, really, really important with understanding that this book is true in its history. As I mentioned last night, for me, the old age time idea, the hundreds of millions of years idea um, was something I couldn't answer biblically. Because quite honestly, I, I really felt like science had, had shown that to be true. And I did not understand. Okay? So tonight we're going to deal with those issues. I want to begin tonight in the book of Colossians. Please turn with me. Colossians. The Apostle Paul, writing to the church in Colossae, he he writes here in in chapter 2, verse 8, something very, very interesting to me. He writes in chapter 2, verse 8, he says, See to it that no one takes you captive. Some translations say enslave you. Through hollow and deceptive philosophy... So he's, he's sharing with this church, there's going to be things that you're going to hear, maybe even in the church, that are going to be hollow and deceptive. And they're going to be so deceptive, this philosophy, this thinking, this worldview, that it will take you captive. What are, what are these hollow and deceptive worldviews? based on, and he says this, he says, which depend on human tradition, so our thoughts, our ideas, our traditions, and on the basic principles of the world. Some translations, you could, you could tr- actually translate the Greek there right into elements of the earth. So in my worldview, as I, as I see what is out there and as I study I find that there are hollow and deceptive philosophies and worldviews. And and almost every time, they're based on something that man has come up with. Not on something observationally uh, testable, repeatable, falsifiable, scientific, but on, on our thoughts, on our ideas, our wishes, if you will. And in most of those cases, especially with an evolutionary worldview, it's based very, very much on the very elements of the earth. Uh, arguing for the fact that matter and energy and, and time, all the things that make us us today, has been here not just from the Big Bang, but some will argue eternally. So instead of an eternal creator <laughs> and savior, it's the principles of the earth, it's the it's the molecules and that stuff that is. So, what does he finish here? He says, no, make sure that no one takes you captive through these hollow, deceptive philosophies, worldviews that depend on human tradition, on man's thoughts, or on basic principles of the world, rather than on who? Christ. He should always be first and foremost. If you are a believer in this building tonight, your thoughts should always be on Christ first. Doesn't mean by any stretch of the imagination he never asked you to do science. That's, that's totally false. We were asked in the garden, if we, if we took the time tonight to go back To go back to chapter 1, and we look at day 6, and he makes man and woman on day 6, and he says to them, be fruitful and increase in number and subdue the creation so that you can rule over it. He uses those terms. Well, those terms, when you look at the Hebrew words there, there was nothing in opposition. A lot of times when we hear subdue, what are we thinking about? We're, We're putting something under our thumb. Like there's something that's going to be more powerful than us, and we've got to subdue it. That's the context in our worldview today. But there was nothing at odds. It was perfect. There was nothing at odds with us. So we have to look at the other possible definitions of those words. 
And one of those, those possible definitions for subduing something is, is, is understanding it. Studying it. Because that rule over it in the next sentence, again, there was nothing at odds that we had to rule over. It, it, that word can simply also mean master it and understand it so you can control it or take care of it. See, I believe the Lord told Adam in the garden to study it so that you can take care of it. It's very hard to take care of something you do not understand. If you will, he asked us to do science. Observe it, test it, repeat it, falsify it. So you can take care of it. So tonight, as we step forward here, last evening we, we discussed and looked at this moment in history, if you will, step back with me to Genesis chapter chapters 6, 7, and 8, right? We, we talked of this global catastrophe that we call the flood. That this flood, more than anything we can study in here, gave us details of things like water or liquid things coming from the great deep. Floodgates opening in the heavens, that's more than nasty rainstorms. Waters increasing on the earth for 150 days. It was not until, until Noah's 601st year when they got off. And the waters had receded enough for them to be able to get off. In the midst of that catastrophe, we could make predictions based on, on what we read last night. And I mentioned we should, we should be able to see that, that if there were... That amount of water should bring that amount of mud or sediment. It should have layered out sediment over the entire planet. And when we study every continent, including Antarctica, we find great levels of sedimentary rock. With dead stuff in it. The dead stuff is called what now? What do we call those things? Fossils, right? Last couple days, uh, Orion has had the opportunity to, to teach a couple different Christian schools. And uh, he asked this morning, he said, so what is a fossil? What are fossils? And the first response was a dinosaur bone. See, I don't know if, if you're like me. If somebody would have asked me that, my first thought would have been, that's a fossil. <laughs> a dinosaur bone. Okay. So tonight, we are going to be talking about the good news of dinosaurs. See, there's many people I come across as we begin talking about fossils. I get, I get this worldview that, that I don't know why we need to talk about dinosaurs. They were nasty. They were ferocious. They were, they were hideous. They were, I've even had somebody say to us, they were created by Satan. First, let's deal with that. We have no biblical understanding anywhere that Satan had the power to create anything. So let's block that one right out of our worldview. Secondly, when was the last time you observed any of them? Alive to know if they were nice or not. See, our worldview, our worldview, what we've seen and heard about them, plays into a great amount of how we see them when they're on a church stage. Okay, so tonight I want to give you some good news about dinosaurs, because maybe you've only heard, only heard bad things about dinosaurs. But dinosaurs, they've impacted our, our world <laughs> to the extent we, we eat them in our dino nuggets. What's interesting about that is, is based on what Ryan shared on Sunday evening, they might actually believe they're eating dinosaurs <clears throat> because that's chicken. But that's, that's, that's if you didn't, if you missed Sunday night, go back and listen to that. I mean, it's impacted our cartoons, right? One of my favorites growing up. Little did I understand that worldview 
is really quite a bit opposed to an evolutionary worldview. Because we have people living with dinosaurs. They were supposed to have gone extinct by then. Okay? And not only living with them, we had done what with them? What did Fred do for his work? He worked in the quarry, right? So we had done what with dinosaurs? We had domesticated them for use. Do not miss tomorrow evening. Look at me. Do not miss my colleague Ryan's presentation tomorrow evening about dinosaurs in history. Don't miss it. This may make way more sense after tomorrow night. But we have dinosaur trains. (laughs) A cartoon until Dr. Scott comes out at the end and tries to reinforce something about dinosaurs that, quite honestly, we most times can't prove one way or the other because all we have today are their fossils. And so we go to museums like the Field Museum in Chicago. Wonderful museum, man. They've got some really, really great specimens. Sue is just one of them. This is when Sue was still in the Great, great Hall as you walk in. Now, uh, tomorrow night, you'll, you'll see again what the what, what dinosaur has replaced her there in that, in that great hall. She's been regretfully moved into the hall of evolution now. <sighs> but we're told about these great creatures. We're told that they lived eons and eons prior to us. Tomorrow evening, Ryan will give you some suggestions of what has happened to them. The most common one is, is that they went extinct by an asteroid 66 million years ago. But see, it's even Dr. Seuss that tells us how old these guys are. Oh, say can you say dinosaur. Here, even in the pages of Dr. Seuss, we learn that they are not hundreds of years old, not thousands of years old, but millions of years, long before you were born. So this idea of deep time or Millions and billions of years. Guys, it it doesn't start late in life. We've all heard it. We've all, we've all to some degrees even accepted it. I did to a degree. As much as I didn't have a biblical answer for it. One, I don't know that I could have told you that the, that the actual history of this book was only, only 6,000 years. Let's see, if we're going to deal with fossils tonight and geology, I need you to understand, I believe the history in this book is right. We've been here 6,000 years. So we've got to be able to explain what what you're seeing behind me on this stage, dinosauria in 6,000 years. For some, I'm really stretching you already this evening. But again, I I share again, there are two worldviews out there about how everything got started. There is the biblical, plainly reading the text, chapter 1, up there on the top of the screen. And there's the evolutionary order in the bottom. There are some, maybe you're here tonight, that that would love to, to argue with me that the Lord could have used evolution. That's fine. I totally agree. He totally could have done that. But that's not what he said he did. If we read the Word of God, you can look, look at the order of things from an evolutionary worldview versus a biblical. Just the order is totally out of order. So the question has to be, if we, if we trust what the Bible says, but we don't think it's telling us the right thing about origins, that part of history, when does the history pick up and we can trust it then? Can we trust the flood? Can we trust Noah? Can we trust Abraham? Can we trust what happened with David? Can we trust... Can, when does history begin, begin to be true in the Bible? See, there's, there's the problem with saying the first part isn't history. So we're left with this column of stack of rocks. In, in these stacks of rocks, these layers of rocks, we find fossils. 
What are fossils, church? Dead stuff. I heard that. Yes. Yes, they would have to be. Yes. Dead stuff. How many of you were like me growing up? If somebody would have said fossil, you would have said a dinosaur bone, probably. See, I, that's, where, that's, that's where my brain, my worldview goes to, right? But quite simply, fossils are just rocks. But not all rocks are fossils. Okay? It's something that used to be living or has come from something that used to be living. And, and when it gets quickly buried, quickly buried, listen to me. Quickly buried is the key to fossilization. Time is not the key to fossilization. It has to be quickly buried. So decomposition and, and scavenging and all these other things do not dissolve it and take it away. It has to be buried very, very quickly. Your, the deer you hit on the side of the road is not going to be, oh, yeah, da, 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 da. <laughs> go cats. <laughs> okay. Um, sorry, taking me back. Woo. I still got a little purple in me. Still do. Even though I'm in the land of crimson and cream, I still, I still got a little purple. <laughs> so. Okay, I, I've got to share. It's so tough. Okay, off top. I'm chasing the rabbit now. <laughs> the first year we moved to Oklahoma, we come back to the state fair every year in Kansas. It's a family thing. My youngest daughter at the time, oh, good grief, I don't even know how old she was. We went by the K-State booth, and we always pick up fans, you know, the fans at the K-State booth, that you fan yourself because it's hot, okay, and the bags and all the stuff at K-State, you pick up the free stuff, right? I, we get back home, and Monday morning I'm heading out to go to, to, go to work, to go, to go to the office, and I'm, I'm checking to make sure I got the garage door shut, and I see in my girls' front window... My youngest had taken her K-State Power Cat fan, had ripped the stick off, and taped it in the front window of our house <laughs> in Norman, Oklahoma. <laughs> I went, oh, if we're not egged by the time I get home, it'll be, okay. So, thank you for bringing that memory back. <clears throat> fossils, where were we? Fo fossils, fossils, <laughs> rocks. Did you know more than... More than 95% of the observed fossil record, check this, more than 95% of the observed fossil record is mollusks, clams, not dinosaurs, not dinosaurs. If, if I represent the entire observed fossil record, like this much of me is just clams that we found over the entire planet. As mentioned the other night, I believe, even at the top of Mount Everest. Mount Everest. I, I mean, the amount of vertebrates that we find is, is very, very, very small in the fossil record. Very small. But see, all of us, if I say dinosaur, we know exactly what I'm talking about, right? Right? There's not a person in here. If I say dinosaur or dinosaur fossil, you don't have some visual image in your head. But see, a, a movie about clams is not near as exciting. <laughs> right? I mean, I don't care if that's most of the fossil record. If that's most of the rocks that are fossils now, <laughs> it just won't make a... It won't make a good, a good movie. A bunch of bivalves hopping around. <laughs> um, but see, we also have a misconception in our worldview that all things that are fossilized are hard, like bones. See, this is a piece of coprolite, dinosaur poopy. It has not always been hard, like a rock. Right? 
It takes the right conditions to get this fossil. Or there are other pieces that's right over there. Okay. Um, it takes the right conditions. And there, there's a fellow, I don't know if you know him, if you've heard of his name, Jack Horner. Have you heard of him? If you were here Sunday night, you've heard of him. He worked with Jurassic Park. He was the main paleontologist that helped them. He writes in a letter in 2003, he said, We found a, a coprolytic ground mass. Fossilized remains of undigested muscle tissue was found in it. Rapid burial of the feces probably was facilitated by a, huh, a flood event. Totally agree, Jack. Now, the flood that he's thinking about and the flood that I'm thinking about are two separate floods. Okay? But see, we know. We know and understand to make a fossil, it has to be buried very, very quickly in lots and lots of mud and water. Uh, th those are the layers we find it in. As we shared with the, with the kids at school um, the last two days, the Niobrara chalk layer in western Kansas, have you heard of this? That, that layer screams the flood of Noah. Screams it to me. Screams it to me to the extent that we find 40-foot-long marine reptiles in it. In the same layer, we find flying reptiles in it. They don't generally live in the same environment, right? <laughs> but they were buried together. See, we have, we have things that we don't normally think about being able to fossilize because a lot of times we think it's just the bones of things, and that's simply not true. I need you to rearrange your worldview this evening. Observationally, we have seen numerous times squid fossilized. Squid, do they have hard parts? Do they have bones? No. Just in case you want to get excited like I do, a few years ago they found a squid that was so well preserved the ink sac was still present and it was still inky. See, I'm trying to affect your worldview on what you think you know about the fossil record. What you've been told about the fossil record. It's not just things that are extinct. We have squid. We have octopus. It's not an alien. <laughs> well, never. I mean, it's happened numerous times. The last time it happened was in Columbus, Kansas, during a public school presentation that I was doing. And I was trying to share with the students, listen, there's more than just extinct things in the fossil record. There's this, and I literally, I put it up. Two class sessions in a row, the first thing out of their mouth was, it's an alien. I went, wow, that's interesting. Two different class periods. <laughs> this idea of rapid burial, we see it in fossils we can find. There are numerous examples of fish eating fish. It does not take long for a fish to eat a fish. It's not like he was sitting there chewing on that fish for hours. I mean, in the Field Museum in, 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 in Chicago, there, there's like a whole little section of fish eating fish. Just several of them. This rapid burial idea. It's interesting, up here behind me on the stage... This is a marine reptile. It is not a dolphin. Okay? They were reptilian. Um, they lived in the water. This specific fossil here came from Germany. The original of this, you are looking at the research replica, the cast of it. The original is, is on display uh, at the American Museum of Natural History in New York City. It is an ichthyosaurus, the state fossil for Utah. It is an ichthyosaurus in the middle of giving birth. This is a female ichthyosaurus. We know that because there is a baby inside of her still. There is one coming out of quite possibly her birth canal. And there's one that looks like it's already been birthed underneath of her tail. I mean, that's remarkable enough. 
until when you begin studying in that very area where this one was found, there have been over 100 of them found, all pregnant. It gets better. In the fossil record, in Utah, the state fossil is the ichthyosaurus. Guess what state the ones in Utah are found in? Pregnant. Giving birth. So what have we just shown in the fossil record? We've shown one, we have an animal, that we have a really good indication of how they gave birth, that they gave birth to live young, and gave birth to them tail first like some of the mammals we have today, dolphins and whales. But we also have, wait, the same catastrophe at the same time buried them on two different continents. Had to be the same time because they're all pregnant in both locations. I need you to understand that just that realization just hit me within this last year. I went, oh really? Huh. Well, that's an interesting fun fact. Fossils. Rapid burial. We have things that are not extinct. Beavers. Except in, in a beaver in the fossil record in Ohio, it, it stood about five feet tall and weighed 300 pounds. Tad different than the beavers we still have today, right? Kind of the same, same kind of goes for this bison right down here, down front. It would have rubbed a basketball goal with its shoulder. A little bigger than what we have today. So I, I need you, as we are thinking about the fossil record tonight, as we, as we get ready to talk more and more about dinosaurs as we go through the night, I, I need you to rearrange what you think you know about fossils. They're not, they're not all extinct creatures. They do not fit or follow an evolutionary timeline in, in the fossil record. They don't. As Ryan shared the other night, not even the, the dinosaur to bird thing fits in their, in their, in their, in their story. Because we have fully formed birds with feathers, real feathers, easily seen plumage feathers, <laughs> flight wings and bones and all, way before the dinosaurs, uh, way under in the fossil record, way under where the dinosaurs that are supposed to be evolving into them show up. So we find... We find things when we actually begin looking in the fossil record. We find things that sometimes can be quite surprising if you have an evolutionary worldview. See, this book says that we were made on day six, the same day he finished the animal kingdom. We talked about it Sunday night. He made these guys on what day? Day six, right? This triceratops, that albertosaurus, those are land animals. They were made on day six. They were finished and called good Right before he makes us in his image. So the Bible suggests to us that we have lived with them. And isn't it interesting when in Glen Rose, Texas, an area of the country that is known for their dinosaur tracks, when just outside of Glen Rose, Texas, several years ago, a, an acrocanthosaurus trackway, left, right, left, right, left, right, was discovered, and as they were excavating that trackway back, they came across this. You see the dinosaur track, right? We, ha we have a copy right over here of it. This, this chunk of rock, that is, an, that is an exact copy in size, okay? The exact copy is a little thinner than the actual rock. The actual rock is on display, that actual fossil is on display at the uh, Creation Evidence Museum in Glen Rose, Texas. You can go see it yourself. The actual rock that came out of the ground is about yay thick, okay? And, and it's, a, it's a dinosaur track. It's an acrocanthosaurus track stepping across another track that has one, two, three, four, five toes. It does look strangely like one you might be familiar with. It's a human right foot. Now you go to the internet and, and the biggest, the biggest um, conflict with this 
comes from a fellow by the name of Mr. Cuban. He, he, he argues very heavily that that's not what this is. The problem is, is the fellow that has it took it to an MRI machine and had it scanned. Because, see, reason with me for a second. If you're talking about a footprint of a dinosaur being stepping, stepping in mud, or a human print stepping in mud, what does the particles and the, and the, the pieces of the mud, is it going to be denser or less dense underneath the footprints? It becomes more dense. So the density of the mud is like this, but when you squish it, it now it's more dense. Are you with me? If it was faked... If it was carved, which is the argument. That's really the only argument. If it's been carved, what would be the density of all the rock under and around? It would all be exactly the same. So an MRI machine shows density of things. After 300 scans, guess what it showed? There's density under both of those footprints right where it needs to be. More dense under that big toe that made that huge impression and the ball of the foot on the human and all under and around that dinosaur track that stepped over and through the human track. No, we haven't lived with them, right? Wait, the word of God says we have lived with them. And there's at least one spot, and there have been others that have argued, there's at least one spot in the fossil record that says we did. So your worldview, your worldview matters. How you see these things matters. See, because about almost 20 years ago now, there was this there was this graduate student for a fellow by the name of Jack Horner. Have you heard of him? Paleontology professor, Montana State University. One of his grad students was out in the field and helping Jack. And Jack had found a femur bone. Your upper leg bone. It would be like, here, here's, here's Albert's femur here. Okay. They found one that was so large. See, you don't take the bone out of the rock out in the field. You take the whole rock and everything in a field jacket. Well, it was so large, they actually had to crack it in half to get it back to the laboratory. Not a normal practice when you find complete fossils. You don't want to break them. But they had to. And so there was a young lady by the name of Mary Schweitzer. She got the opportunity to study the middle of a femur bone of a T-Rex. See, she was trained in sciences, in understanding the scientific method, observing, testing, repeating, falsifying. She, she began using first the, these wonderful instruments of science. She said in her paper, she said, as I observed this bone, the first thing I noticed is the outside of the bone looked different than the middle of the bone, observationally. Then she used this wonderful little device for science. And she said, you know, the closer I got to it, the more it, it smelled like it was still decaying. Now, the rock layer that it was found in was dated roughly 90 million years old. But her, her eyes were seeing what looked like non-fossilized, non-rock non permineralized bone in the middle, and her nose was detecting decay in that bone because it stunk. Both of which were really at odds with her worldview because she believed that it was 90 million years old. And then she, she took some of it and she she washed it in a solution as Jack had taught her to do with fossils so, so that you get an, an uncontaminated sample. And to her surprise, this is what it did when she put it under a microscope. To her surprise, as she exclaims here in 60 minutes, it was stretchy. Stretchy 
original biomaterial of a T-Rex. Never thought she'd ever see that. <laughs> right? Because fossils are what again? They're supposed to be rocks. Well, this one wasn't. Only the outer edge appeared to be. She took some of the material and they began slicing up really, really thin so they could study it. And to her next surprise, she finds red blood cells. She wrote in her paper, she said, I had other colleagues in the lab that day, and so I didn't tell them what they were going to see. I just wanted them to come over and see if they saw what I thought I was seeing. Little round red things in the middle of a vascular structure, out of the middle of the bone. So that she has her colleagues come over, and they would come over, and they'd look in, and they you have red blood cells, Mary, so what? <laughs> what do you, why, why is this significant? Like, why do I need to look at this? <laughs> she says, it's out of that femur bone of that T-Rex. One of them asked her, have you told Jack yet? She said, no, I haven't, I haven't told him yet. So she tells Jack... Jack, Jack says, Mary, you need to make sure, do all testing and make sure, make sure it's maybe not what you thought it, it is. All tests came back positive for hemoglobin, a.k.a. what? Blood. Blood. In a 90 million year old fossil. She said in 2005... I am quite aware that according to conventional wisdom and models of fossilization, these structures aren't supposed to be there. But there they are, and I was pretty shocked. See, she's a doctor now. And, and, and she, she has continued, her life's work is looking for, if you will, soft tissue in the fossil record. And she has found, she's found lots and lots and lots of it. Almost, almost every time she breaks something open, she's finding soft original tissue. <laughs> Does that scream 90 million years old to anybody sitting in here tonight? Now, please, please, please listen to me. She does not accept what the word of God's history is. She has spent a lot of her life's work as she finds, continually finds new pieces of soft tissue, more vessels. You can see the vessels there, and you can see the, the, even the red blood cells in the vessels there. At, at present, last I checked, there's like six different ideas out there why we should still be able to have all this. Guess how many of them are, are being peer-reviewed and are coming out positively for, yeah, we still have soft tissue. None of them not working out well to try to explain it in an evolutionary worldview but see i i don't believe them to be millions of years old i believe these samples that we have from myosaurs t-rexes uh, we have we have numerous dinosaurs now red blood cells numerous i believe them to have been buried during the what the flood like 4300 years ago you do understand the conditions have to be just right even to have them for 4,300 years. Let alone millions of years. But it, see, it doesn't stop there. See, most of you, or at least some of you in here, I know as I showed you the red blood cells, your brain begins working because we've seen movies. And you're like, wait a minute, if we've got red blood cells... <laughs> We can make a dinosaur, <laughs> right? 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 Who was thinking it? See, I, I know some of you are thinking it, right? So you're like, <laughs> off the coast of Costa Rica right now, on an island. No, no. <sighs> DNA is, is exponentially more fragile than the red blood cell is. So the thought has been for many, many years, this was in the 90s when she made her first discovery, and so this has been going on a while, but we never, never, we never really thought we would be able to get DNA out of any of that until April of 2020. 
These are the images of the first discovered DNA of a dinosaur. See, there's little chemicals we can put on, we can put on the nucleus in a cell that then when it is scanned, it lights up. <laughs> so there's this fella by the name of um, Jack Horner. Have you heard of him? Do you see the two, two separate rows here? Okay. This is the dinosaur, soft tissue, that then they stained with this special chemical. And when it bonds, what it does is it bonds with, with broken pieces of the, of the double helix. It bonds. So then when you, when you apply, and when you apply this, this scan and this, this light energy to it, 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 it ignites. It lights. <laughs> so you can see it. And so we have, we have definite spots in this dinosaur's present with its dinosaur DNA. Just so you know that, that we know that's how that works, he has taken a what? Can you read that? An emu. What is an emu? A bird. What is Jack Horner's worldview about dinosaurs and birds? <laughs> he has stated on another video that he hopes very that maybe maybe not too far into the future he will be able to take one of his emus off of his ranch in Montana and turn it back into a dinosaur. De evolve it, if you will. So it's interesting, he uses emu cells to show you the connection. Look. You could do that with any cell, but I have to believe he did that on purpose with an emu. So, we have DNA. That is, that is April 2020, like a month after everything went chaos in the world. This is the most recent DNA found in dinosaur nucleus of cells. This is last year. Guys... We have original biomaterial, soft tissue, unfossilized material in every era of the geologic column. Every era of the geologic column. From the top to the bottom. We even have original material, non-fossilized, non-decayed material in the Precambrian. Now, those of you that are geologists, that may mean something to you. See, Precambrian is before the explosion of life in an evolutionary worldview. That is over, that is close to a billion years ago. A billion with a B. We have original tissue that is a billion years old. So we either are not seeing what we're actually seeing scientifically, but the problem is that's observable, testable, repeatable, falsifiable. Guess what is not? The date being attached to it. You know, the other night, he, Ryan showed very clearly this idea that Dinosaurs would have had feathers, but every piece that we continue to find of skin, guess what they all look like? They all have scales. There is a wonderful, hmm, a wonderful database that has been worked on for several years now. Uh, the, the site's down there at the bottom. It, it's put out by a, a scientist by the name of Dr. Brian Thomas and another uh, um, scientist by the name of, of, of Joel Tay, um, they have been scouring through scientific peer-reviewed journals since 1954. And at present, their list, their spreadsheet, is up to 119 samples of original biomaterial found in the fossil record and, and published in scientifically peer-reviewed journal papers. On the chart, for those of you that want to be a nerd like myself, on the spreadsheet, if you want the site, I will give it to you. Anybody can go to it and keep track of it. They list 
the evolutionary age to the sample that was found. <laughs> they list the sample that was found. They list the journal that it was published in. They give you everything about it. it it's just a, it, it, it's a, it's a stack of data is what it is. A remarkable stack of data. Original material. Over 119 samples. Seriously, every era of the geologic column and pre-Gambrian. It, it is a great work. In case you think it's just, it's just a bunch of creationists coming up with stuff, see? See, these two creationists have sat down and went, well, let's go through the peer-reviewed journals of science. So it's not just that that we're finding. It's not just that soft tissue stuff. We're actually now beginning to find fully intact dinosaurs, not just the bones of them. This is the entire front half of a notosaur found in Alberta, Canada. They said when they found him, it's almost as if he just laid down and went to sleep. He is so well preserved. Pigmentation in his scales is still there. They said, and I have not followed up on him, they said, if we continue to dig into him, we believe that we will find intestines intact. So we're not talking this kind of dinosaur. We're talking full dinosaur. I got the opportunity to go to Toronto. Ooh, what's it been now? Maybe two and a half years ago now. Pre-COVID. It was pre-COVID. Because none of us have been to Canada since then. Okay, so um, there's a church outside of Toronto that's had us up there a couple times. Um, it, it's fun. It's fun to go to Canada and just hear the A. Anyways, and um, I love my brothers and sisters up there. They're, they're, they're cool. And uh, hanging out with them. And, and they have this museum down in Toronto called the ROM. It's the Royal Ontario Museum. It's like their, woo, that's their, their natural history museum, right? And so we had a free day while we were there to be able to jump on and run, run in on the little tram thing. And so we went down with their, with their youth minister and went through the ROM. I get to the ROM and, I, and, I, and I'm asked as I'm buying tickets, do I want tickets to go see Zool? And I said, Zool? I'm like, and then it clicked with me. Zool? See, I have a buddy in youth ministry in Missouri who had went to visit his son that was in youth ministry in Montana. And one afternoon, while I'm doing something at camp, I get a text of a picture of him standing on top of a bluff overlooking rock. And he's like, Matt, guess where I am? And I'm like, I have no idea where you are. I'm in Montana, and I'm looking. I just sent you a picture of where Zool was excavated. This was a year and some before I was in Toronto. And I said, well, who's Zool? I don't even know who that is. He said, it's the most recent dinosaur found up here in Montana. And he was, he's really, really well preserved from what I understand. I went, really? You don't say. Well, so here I am in the ROM in Toronto. And they're bringing back to my memory. Zool. I'm like, yes, I want to see Zool. So we get the exhibits. And, and to my, whoo. See, the paleontologist that was working on Zool in Montana was a Canadian from the Royal Ontario Museum. And so you walk into an exhibit, and on display is his entire head. Scales and all. You walk around the corner, his entire back. See, Zool is an ankylosaur. He, 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 he was the one that had that ball on his tail. You know, they were kind of, they were four-legged and they were, they were lower to the ground, armored back. That's his entire back with, with spikes and scales between spikes. Still in the field jacket on display. There, there's Teresa standing right here. Teresa's standing there for scale. It's a good size back. And they make this exhibit to keep you away from it. <laughs> I'm thankful for cell phones. <laughs> I mean, I was, leaning, I was leaning over as far as I could get over with my cell phone, get as close to that thing as possible without getting kicked out. 
Because what I was seeing in between, what, what, what I thought I was seeing between those spikes, by the way, they've tested some of those spikes, they are keratin. And the keratin is still keratin. It is not fossilized. It's not fossilized. Remnants of keratin, it is keratin. Everybody grab your fingernail in case you forget what keratin is. They were made of the same stuff as our fingernails. How do we know it? Because it's right there. <laughs> do you see the, the color difference? Can you see the color difference there? I mean, yeah, okay, we got these. This is where they've tried to repair cracks to keep it from falling apart. Because part of it's fossilized. But this is its skin. And it is a different color than the rest of the stuff. That's where we got the first idea that they were rusty color. Because the pigmentation is still there. <laughs> you go around the corner. Here, here's Teresa in the background. You can see my wife Teresa back here. That's his whole entire tail. See the ball? <laughs> and, that, and look, when you look close at it, you see right on the tail? You see all these little stripes? Can you see that? You can probably see stripes from the back. Those aren't, those aren't stripes of his skin. Those are the muscles and tendons that run up and down his tail. Preserved. <laughs> I, I am going through this exhibit that afternoon just praising the Lord that, that Zul was found. And you're, you're exiting out of the exhibit and then there's this sign. It says at the top, for those that can't see in the back, what happened to Zool? And then it's in French, because we were in Ontario. And so it's got some pictures here, okay? Let me zoom in. Here's what he says. It says, Zool, wa, uh, Zool died and was quickly washed into a river, likely during a, fl a flood. Quickly. Check the, what did I say? How do we make fossils? They, they have to be buried very quickly with lots of what? Mud and water. Okay. So we have, Zul died and was quickly washed into a river. Did we observe that? No. So this is just an idea. Washed into a river, likely during a flood, it says. Huh. Monsoons were common in this area. Okay, now wait a minute. Have we observed monsoons in northern Montana a hundred and some million years ago? Did we observe those? So like, how, how do we come up with the monsoon thing? Because all of the rock layers in that area show great amounts of water, which means you've got to have some kind of an event that caused great amounts of water. The only thing we know about are flooding and monsoons. Monsoons were common in this area. Zool may even have been killed by a flood. I totally agree. Totally agree. We just don't agree on the time. <laughs> Always about the time. It's always about the time. I think, I think some of the geologic column in these great ages get us thinking that maybe we have more time than we think we have. Like if we've been here for millions of years, what's, what's another million? I mean, how, how do we know for sure that Jesus is even going to come back in our lifetime, right? That's going to come back, but he's going to come back later. I don't need to worry about those things now. Oh, we got eons. It's been 2,000 years since he left. I mean, when's he coming back? <laughs> Please don't miss it. I pray you're ready for it when he comes back. We haven't been here millions of years. We've been here thousands of years. In 2 Peter chapter 3, the passage that gets used often to try to argue deep time. To the Lord, a day is like a thousand years, and a thousand years is like a day. Notice it's a like issue. It doesn't say to the Lord, a day is a thousand years. It says it's like a thousand years. It means he's not governed by our time. In the context of the passage is him coming back, church. It may seem like thousands of years to you and I. But it's like days to him. He will be back in a blink. That's the context of the passage. It has nothing to do with evolutionary time. It has nothing to do with that. 
So we have this geologic column. If I were to ask you tonight, who first put the geologic column together? Out of an audience this size, maybe a few could give me an answer for that. How many have heard and know about the geologic column? I think every one of us. If you, if you went through earth science or geology class, you've learned about the geologic column. This wonderful stack of rocks, right? Problem is, is a fellow by the name of Charles Lyell in the early 1800s and, and 20 some of his, his friends, they began developing a different worldview about the world and its history outside of Genesis. And, and so... As they began developing this idea, they began looking at rocks, and they began, well, very arbitrarily, listen to me, very arbitrarily stacking them, naming them, and then putting a date to them. And their worldview, as he writes in one of his letters, is this, we wanted to do in science whatever will free the science from who? Moses. See, In science, up till the early 1800s, most in science believed this book to be true. But see, there was a group of them that were like, there's no way. We we can't, we don't like the history there, so we've got to come up with an alternative. So they begin working in this geology field. But out of those 20-some guys that were arbitrarily setting these things, they, they weren't all geologists. They were, they were lawyers and, and doctors. And... But we had non-geologists stacking a group of rocks, dating them, finding index fossils in each one of those layers. And so the, the statement is said, we know which layer of rock it is based on the fossils we find in the rock. And therefore, we can date that layer of rock by the fossils we find in the rock. Well, how, how old is this trilobite? <clears throat> well, trilobites come out of these layers here. And so this trilobite is 550 million years old up to maybe somewhere around 475. Well, how do we, it doesn't have a tag on it that says it's that old. Because trilobites are found in that layer of rock. And that layer of rock is that old. That's what those guys said. That's what they said. You remember Jack Horner the other night on the video, right? We classify birds as dinosaurs. Why? Because we said so. This stack of rocks on the right-hand side of this column was made and established because we said so. Go check the history that we don't get taught. Go check the history that we do not get taught. So we have this column. So a fellow from Harvard stated this in 2005. He says, A great achievement of 19th century science was learning to use fossils as distinctive time indicators. That allowed the wonderful scale to come into being. See, he says... Because we find these index fossils like trilobites, that's how we know how old all the stuff is. Again, there's no tag that says I'm 520 million years old. But it's interesting because every one of us have an idea in our head, an idea in our worldview that says that these dates have got to be right. Most times... It's radiometric dating. But can I share a truth about radiometric dating with you right quick? Check out what what this fellow said about radiometric dating. The rocks do date the fossils, but the fossils date the rocks more accurately. We don't have definitive dates on either one of them, but that's okay. Okay, so the rocks do date the fossils, and the fossils date the rocks more accurately. Radiometric dating would not have been feasible, possible feasible, if the geologic column had not been erected 
What's he say? That means if we did not have this stack of rocks with these dates attached to those layers first, he says we would not be able to do radiometric dating. Now, why would he ever say that? See, here's what I find. Who's heard of carbon dating? Come on, raise your hand if you've heard of carbon dating. We've all heard of carbon dating. For some of us, it's that carbon dating thing that we think tells us that things are millions of years old. That's your first problem. Carbon dating will never, listen, focus. Carbon dating will never give you a date that is accurate over 50,000 years. It. How, how old class does carbon dating give you a date for? The upper echelon is 50,000 years. Now listen, every once in a while you might get one that is up to 100,000. But they will clearly state, and it will have an asterisk or something on that date that is over 50,000. And it will say something to the effect, but not... Not guaranteed, not, not authorized, not whatever. Okay, because 50,000 is kind of like that max for a carbon date. So wait, how old are dinosaurs supposed to be? How many millions? When did they, when did they go extinct? 66 million. If you're, if you're 65 million, keep up with the science. It's 66 now. So... So if, in your worldview, you think carbon dating has proved that dinosaurs are millions of years old, you do not understand carbon dating. What it can and it can't do. So there's this radiometric dating. Listen, focus, stay with me. We're going to get a little technical for just the next few moments. Focus. Everybody stand up real quick. Stand up. I've been going at it a while, and I don't have much longer. But I got to get you to get this. I can't, I can't have you missing what I'm about to share with you. Because in the back of our worldview, most of us have radiometric dating as a scientific, provable thing. You know what? There is science involved with it. The observing, the testing, the repeating. But as soon as a date gets attached to radiometric dating, it ceases being science. Let me state it again. We can observe, test, repeat, and falsify radioactive decay within rocks. In the umbrella of radio act, uh, radiometric dating, there are all kinds of radiometric dating. There is potassium and argon. There is rubidium strontium. There is, there is uranium lead. There is carbon dating. There is all these different dating methods. Every one of the different dating methods give you different dates. Listen to me. Every one of the dating methods, radiometric dating methods, will give you a different range of dates. You may have a C if you'd like. So what did the fella say? We couldn't have done radiometric dating if what wasn't established first? That column. Those dates. If the layers of rock did not already have dates attached to them... As we observe radioactive decay of rubidium to strontium or, or, or potassium to argon or, or radiocarbon to nitrogen, whatever the case may be in the radioactive element that we're observing to try to put a date to, see, if we don't already have the dates, we wouldn't know where to start. Did you catch it? So when you bring a fossil in or you something you bring into a radiometric dating laboratory, the first question they ask you is, what layer did you get this in? By asking that question first, listen to me, go check me. You know, I, I beg everybody that ever comes to anything that I, when we're teaching, you need to continue to do research. I beg of you. You take anything to a radiometric dating laboratory and you want the, to get the radiometric date for something. The first question they ask you is, which layer, which layer did you get it in? So if you got it in Mesozoic rock, that's a date range. 
from 66 million down to about 250 million years old. So which radiometric dating process is going to be picked to give that date range? The, are they going to use carbon dating class? No, because the max carbon dating is 50,000 years. So they're going to find one that will give them some kind of a date between 100, from 66 to 250 million. Are you, are you following me so far? Generally speaking, that will be uranium to lead. So let me show you how radiometric dating works, okay? Let's say we have a dinosaur bone. We've taken it to a laboratory in Alberta and Canada, and we've said, hey, we want to get the radiometric date for this um, Edmontosaurus bone. So they use uranium to lead dating. So here's how it works. In this dinosaur bone, there are uranium atoms that get built up as it's becoming fossilized. Everybody with me? So a little uranium, a little U. You guys with me? You with me? Mm -hmm. Okay. In a half-life, who's heard the term half-life? In a half-life, a half-life means when you have a radioactive element like uranium, right? You, all radioactive, you know, little Geiger counter thing. Okay. If you're radioactive, it makes that little noise, right? Okay. So uranium, as it builds up, as it as it becomes fossilized. Wait, wait. Are all dinosaur bones fossilized, class? No, okay, but let's just go with it. They're all fossilized. So they're fossilized, and they have uranium in it, and uranium then begins decaying away. In one half-life, the uranium in that sample will decay away and leave behind peanut butter. No, that is not peanut butter. PB is lead. Now, you'll never forget what the symbol for lead is. It is peanut butter. It is PB. So in that sample, one half-life. Now, now check this. Woo! Do you know what the half-life of uranium-238 is? What one half-life is? 4.2 billion years. In 4.2 billion years, half of the uranium would have, would have went away and left behind lead. How long, wait, let's stop for a second. Before we continue with that bus, okay, let's back the truck up for a second. And let's discuss, how long have we known about radioactivity? Come on. Come on. How about movie buffs? Come on. There was a movie Amazon put out like two years ago, a year and a half ago, about a lady and her husband. It's called Radioactive. Why was it called Radioactive? Because Madame Curie, Madame Curie, go back and check your, check your science book. Madame Curie and her husband discovered, if you will, radioactive elements. Like they physically were crushing uranium and, ex and getting out of, of uranium radioactive iridium. They would put it in vials. She would go to bed every night holding her glowing vial of iridium in her hand did not understand what they were doing the level of which radiation they were poisoning themselves madame curie when, when, when was she doing that in history 1880 1883 how long back in history is that that we've discovered radioactive elements about 150 years so we've only been observing radioactive decay for 150 years, but yet the half-life of uranium is 4.2 billion years. How much of a half-life of uranium have we even observed? Not even a sneeze of it. But let's just go with it all being... Let's just go with it. So the first half-life... Half of the uranium pieces leave behind lead. What's going to happen in the next half-life? Half of the uranium that is left in it, half of that uranium in the next half-life will decay and leave behind more lead. So when you uranium lead tests something for a date of it, you compare the amount of lead in that sample with the amount of uranium in that sample. Everybody good? So if there is... 
a bigger discrepancy between the two, that means it's what? Older or younger? Much, much older. If they're closer together, that means they are, it's younger. Hasn't been decaying as long. That uranium didn't build up, it didn't build up and start decaying as fast. Okay, everybody good? Four things you have to assume. And look, this works the same for potassium and argon or, or rubidium and strontium or, or carbon, radiocarbon. It all works the same. Here are your four assumptions quickly. First, do we know exactly how much uranium was there when it started decaying away? No. We make an educated guess. Secondly, how, do we know if all of the lead is there because of just the uranium decay? We cannot guarantee that. Because when we say that, then we, we don't know if in the case of uranium lead, that that whole system has stayed and done just what we're thinking it's doing for millions or even billions of years. And so maybe extra lead hasn't been added in from outside source. What would that do to the date if extra lead was added in from an outside source? It would totally skew the date. And last but not least, what if, what, if, what if we don't have the decay rate right? What does that do to the date? Totally changes it, doesn't it? Really? Well, what, wouldn't it be interesting? Oh, I don't have my slide. Where's my slide? Hmm. 2010, Discovery News science reporter is writing about a scientific experiment going on at Stanford University and Purdue University simultaneously. They were looking at radioactive elements and they realized radioactive decay rates are changing. What? Wait a minute. How many of you have ever heard that radioactive decay rates are constant? Go check your biology textbook right here in Hugoton, Kansas. Check your earth science textbook. Radioactive decay rates are constant. Except for scientific experiments going on with Purdue and Stanford University, evidently. Because they discovered radioactive elements were changing. See, they were, they were expecting the decay rate to be very constant of a, of a radioactive element called cesium. That, so it decays very, very, very quickly so we can observe it. So say this is the, the decay rate. They expected it to be very constant. The problem was, as they were discovering, they... they It would change from time to time. What should those two scientific discoveries simultaneously at the same time with peer review between the two of, the, two of those schools, what should that do to every radiometric date that has ever been given for anything? We should at the least be going, uh-oh, maybe we, ooh, we probably ought to check that. I mean, if one, element, one radioactive element is changing, what does that say about every other radioactive element? And then it, well, they went on to say, we don't even know why. We've got ideas. Maybe we, there's particles coming from the sun that we don't know about. Really? Like, that is very obvious to me. That, that we think we have everything in the sun figured out. Like, we've got it all figured out. Like, we know exactly what that thing's all about over there. That it couldn't possibly be sending some kind of little particle that we can't see and detect yet, and it might actually be affecting things. That seems pretty obvious to me. The K rates are changing. So wait. Carbon dating. What's the maximum date of carbon dating? 50,000 years. What if we were to find carbon, radiocarbon in a dinosaur bone? The half-life of radiocarbon is 5,730 years. Every 5,730 years, to the best of our understanding, <laughs> radiocarbon in a sample, every 5,730 years, half of it decays away. Next half-life, 5,730 years, half of that decays away. 
So there was this guy by the name of Jack Horner. And there was a pastor and creationist out of Denver, Colorado, who back in the early 2000s found out about this soft tissue stuff that Jack Horner had and red blood cells. Have you seen those before? Just nod. Bob Inyart, this pastor and radio talk show host out of Denver, Colorado, writes a letter to Jack Horner and says, Hey, Jack, um, I'm willing to give you $10,000 to use in your museum up there in Montana, however you want to use it. We want to pay for that soft tissue to be carbon dated. <laughs> well, one, we have soft tissue that we never thought we'd ever have. We have red blood cells we never thought we'd have. Might as well carbon date it, right? We carbon date things that were or are living. That's the stuff we carbon date. Well, he never heard anything. Jack never called him back. Surprise, surprise, right? So one day on his radio talk show, he calls Jack on the radio. So what you're about to hear is, is a very small portion of an eight-minute conversation. The reason it's going to be a small portion is because there are words uttered after, after where I stop it that you don't need to use. Whether you're in the church or out, in my opinion. Church, listen to me. I've been going on for like almost an hour and a half. Wow, look at the clock. This is a spiritual battle for your soul. This is not science we're talking about. If it was science, we would do all science that it takes to do science. <laughs> we would do, we'd do everything we can to find the truth. But see, if, if we aren't doing the right kind of science, then we don't want to discuss it. You creationists are not doing the right kind of science. We're not going to discuss it. So Bob calls him, actually gets a hold of him. It's quite an amazing eight-minute conversation. It's online. You can go get it, the whole thing. He says, hey, Jack, I don't know if you got my letter or not, but here's who I am. I sent you a letter a few months ago. <laughs> um, and Jack's like, uh... Uh, it doesn't say much. You know? He said, well, here's, here's where I'm at. I, I want to, what if I double it? What if I, what if I, what if I get you $20,000? Would you do the test? That's where the conversation picks up. Here's what Jack has to say. Um, let, let me, let me tell you where I'm coming from here. Sure. All right. Obviously your group is a group of creationists. Yes. And and um, and the spin they can get off of it, right? Doing it is well, not going to help. Not going to help us. Yeah. So even though it's just a scientific test, they're they're not well, asking it's, for it's voodoo. Not a, it's not actually a scientific test. That's what I'm trying to tell you. Carbon fourteen dating something <laughs> with soft tissue in it. <laughs> <laughs> um. It ceases being a nice conversation. Jack becomes very upset. Guys, this is not about the science. It's not about science. It's about your soul. It's a spiritual battle. You know why I know that? Jack just proved it to me. Because if it was about science, he would take the crazy creationist money. Maybe even ask for 50000 I mean, what, what's he got to lose? He is so sold on his worldview. If he is that convictional about his worldview and his position that that bone and that soft tissue is 90 million years old, prove the crazy creationist wrong, do the carbon test, show that it's not, not 50,000 years or younger. But he doesn't. He doesn't. Because if it's right then he might be accountable to something else in his life. Are you hearing me? That's how I see it. That's what my worldview says. So there was this guy by the name of Brian Thomas. He works for Institute for Creation Research. He began working on a doctorate. His doctorate was going to focus on soft tissue in the fossil record. 
as part of his research, he took 16 samples, him and another, another fellow, the fellow that wrote the series of books out there on the table called um, um, Untold Secrets of Planet Earth, right? right I, can, I don't know why that is so hard for me to remember that series. Anyways, great series out there. Him and Vance Nelson, Dr. Thomas and Vance Nelson, they set out and they took 16 samples out of every era of the geologic column. Are you with me? All those three major eras out of the geologic column. Took them from all over the world, so they're not like from one location on the planet. Then they divided them, sent them to the five leading carbon dating laboratories in the world. Not a bunch of creation laboratories. The leading, the ones that everybody gets their carbon stuff tested at. Says, hey, check these samples, please, and give us a, a carbon date for them. <laughs> here are your 16 samples over here, listed. You can't read them in the back, I understand. There's wood, there's, there's dinosaurs. That's an Edmontosaur. That's this kind of dinosaur right here. A Ceratopian, that would be a, a, a horned-faced one. Okay, a triceratops, part of a bone, and a horn, a horn of a triceratops, some hadrosaurs, uh, some more wood. This is the uh, geologic column era that they would have been found in, and these are the dates of, by an evolutionary date, based on the rock layers they find them in, from 10 million all the way down to 200 and, and what is it, 50? 290 million year old. Guess how many samples had measurable radiocarbon in them? Do you see the stars? The stars means there was measurable radiocarbon in them. All under what line? <laughs> the observable amount of radiocarbon where we, we think it decays enough that we can't see it anymore. How many of those 16 samples? Every one of them. Dinosaur bones still have radiocarbon in them. Can they be 90 million years old? He went on in his doctorate to do 30 plus more samples. Guess how many of those 30 samples had radiocarbon in them? Every one of them. When you read his doctoral dissertation that he put in lay person form, for those of you that want to just get nerdy, It, it, it's it's somewhat lay person. Okay. <laughs> he writes in here, as he's working on his doctorate, he says, you know what? When I began asking the laboratories, these carbon dating laboratories, he says, how many times have you ever checked a sample and you've gotten no radiocarbon whatsoever in a sample? Like, how many blanks are there? Guess what they told him? We've never discovered a blank. Now, wait a minute. If every sample that has ever been tested fits within the measure of measurable radiocarbon, what does that say to every date we have that is over 50,000 years? Now, please listen to me. There's assumptions being made with radiocarbon, just like there is in, in uranium lead. You're, all those four, some, those, they're still assuming. You're assuming the, the decay rate of radiocarbon is the same and all that. But the science behind it is this. If it's really that old, we should not see radiocarbon. I don't care what date you stick to it. The observable, testable, repeatable part of the science is we can observe the radioactive element and we can observe what's left over. As soon as we put a date to it, we've left science. That's worldview. But if we can observe radiocarbon in every sample ever tested, <laughs> and we have soft tissue... In every era of the geologic column, we have red blood cells, and we now are finding DNA. I, 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 I totally predict we will find more and more DNA and more and more intact DNA. <laughs> you do not have to believe this on blind faith. We are never asked to believe this on blind faith. Ever. 
We, we, can, we can literally do science today, and it, and, and it will never prove that it's wrong. Ever. When we come across something that we think has, we better check it. Make sure our science is right. Because this is not wrong. I hope that excites you this evening. That dinosaurs, they speak good news. That the good news is good news.